Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Future Tech podcast series. It's me, Charlie Sell, the Group MD of Arrows Group. And this podcast series is aimed at STEM graduates, where I am interviewing CTOs, CIOs, leaders within uh, tech companies, asking a bit about their story, their thoughts on emerging technology, and the all important advice for future graduates. So really pleased to have Nigel Moulton with me today. Nigel is the former CTO of the Infrastructure Services Group at Dell and now uh, Exec Director and CTO at Value8 and, and a guy who's got quite a career history to him. So really glad to have you on the show. Hi, Nigel. Charlie, so firstly, thank you for the, uh, for the welcome and the opportunity. Brilliant to be working alongside you. Um, just a sort of a brief background, uh, I was at Dell for the best part of seven years, and I was part of the organization that was basically responsible for the sort of the cloud strategy and some of the IT strategy when talking to very large enterprises or, or service providers. So that was very much the focus of the work that, that I did there. And as I was leaving, and we'll talk more about this, I think the opportunity presented itself to actually go and work for a small startup that is very much focused on taking businesses that have an absolute imperative to do digital, particularly in, you know, in 2020 and the times we find ourselves, and to basically be in a position where you have a group of you know, IT professionals who've been in the industry for a while and know how this thing works, and to take organizations and help them on their digital journey, because right now there's no place to hide. So you know, being digitally transformed or understanding the concepts of that and what it means, you know, these are fundamental right now, and what Value8 aims to do is sort of help organizations, regardless of size or scale, actually go along that journey. Well, that's fantastic. And, and I have to agree with you. Digital transformation, I mean, it's, it's a buzzword to many people. But actually, yeah. when you really, truly understand what it means, it's, it's, it's now embedded in every industry sector there is, isn't it? When you think about recent times, as well as the trend over the last 10 years. Yeah, it has become a bit of a cliche. I agree. But it's fundamental. Because it's not so much the technology aspects to it, because we'll get into that, I think, but it's the culture. Because if you have a culture in an organization which is actually prepared to embrace digital uh, and to change ways of working, to change business practices, you know, these are the sort of practical things that people have to do day to day to sit behind an e-commerce capability, an outreach capability, a social media capability, you know, these are sometimes what people think as, as, as having the front end to that, but it's the actual people process and the technology which is fundamental. And if you get that right, then you become a digitally transformed business. If you get it wrong, it's, it's incredibly hard. But as yeah. I said, right now, there's nowhere to hide. Yeah, yeah, again, couldn't agree with you more. So let's hear a bit about your story then. So, so how did you get into technology and, and, and a bit about the career? Sure. So um, I, I've always been a little bit of a tinkerer, right? So uh, my father before me was an electrical engineer. So there were always bits and pieces around the house where we'd be sort of dismantling radios or there'd be, you know, there'd be stuff that he would have in his sort of, in his sort of mini workshop where I was always encouraged to sort of look, tinker, you know, break things per se, but not really break things. Um, and so I always had this love of, of sort of engineering and, and the desire to understand how things worked. And I was fortunate in that um, as I went through school and as I went through education in the sort of mid to late 1980s, the computer revolution had just about broken. So people were now having home computers. Uh, it was the first time this had ever really been done. So the mass market for these machines became, became affordable. And schools and colleges started to add a degree of computing science into their mainstream education courses. So I graduated from Thames Valley University in the late 1980s as an electrical and electronics student. That's what I did. You know, my major was, was those subjects. And I did a little bit of computer science on, on the side. But as I left, I was a sort of a Swiss army knife in terms of the skill set that I had and where the industry was at the time. And so my first three jobs at a university were basically repairing circuit boards. I worked for companies that uh, deployed technology in the printing industry uh, and then in the very young computer networking industry. And it's that industry I joined uh, in, again, the sort of early 1990s, essentially doing bench repair. My job involved a soldering iron and a oscilloscope. And, you know, that in itself was fascinating for a while. 
but you become aware of the fact that actually uh, that love of technology combined with your ability to be a people person is actually you know what what really gets you going from a career perspective in companies so i moved out of bench repair i did training and education so i taught operating systems for a while i then moved into systems engineering which is basically the architectures that you need when you're designing large complex networks that connect you know multiple sites together within different organizations and again this is a given today but back 30 years ago this was this was brand new stuff so I took a love of engineering, married it with a you know, desire to, to meet people, to talk to people without being a salesman per se, but to actually go into that world and, and manage through a sort of a, a technical and a, and, a, and a sales and an engineering approach. I then joined uh, a company called Cisco Systems. I was there for eight years and I managed products. So I took products from their very design and, and, and early evolution phase through the creation of them, the combination of the, hard, the hardwares and the software that, that was used to create these products, and then how you market them. So how you teach an internal sales force to sell them, how you get the market to accept them, how you work with industry analysts to sort of show them that the path that you're on is the, the, sort, the sort of right sort of path. And this sort of time as the internet was just starting to be born in the mid to, mid to late 90s now. And so the way in which that revolutionized not only my own job, but the career and the possibilities that it brought about was you, you can never underestimate it. And I am fortunate to have lived through that time. And I'm fortunate to be in a company like Cisco that was very much at the forefront of driving that. I then branched out into uh, uh, a little more sort of engineering and product and product management. And I ended up working for a company called Avaya. And I, that's when I acquired a CTO title for the same time, for the first time. And that was 10 years ago. And a CTO's role is very much to take a look at the underlying technology and to do two things with it. One, horizon scan for it. So what's coming down the track? What looks interesting? Uh, and what can I bring into my organization to help improve the product that I have or the solution that I sell? And then secondly, it's a big piece around education, educating your own internal employees who are trying to sell and represent your company bringing customers into a door and also showing them that the vision that you have for the industry that you're in, the direction that it's going in, that you are completely in tune with that and that you are shaping it rather than it shaping you. Okay. So being at that front edge, and I think of it as the leading edge of an airplane wing, right? That's where you first contact the air. That's where the disturbance that gets caused over the wing afterwards. But if you can be at the leading edge of it, you know, that's very much what a CTO function is. It is embedded in engineering, in my opinion, the best CTOs come from an engineering background. But the world we live in today, you cannot have that without a set of commercial skills yeah. that you can embed with your technology skills and the passion that you have for it to actually show how you can take, you know, as we, as we come on bang up to date now, the use of cloud technologies, how disruptive they are and how they actually allow companies to talk about the digital transformation journey that, that we started discussing cloud again is a fundamental principle that underpins that because it does allow you to radically alter the way that you think of the computing services that you use it dramatically lowers the cost and complexity associated with going to market and it gives you reach and scale that you know frankly would take hundreds of millions of pounds and years to achieve otherwise so it's turned on the taps for organizations of any size or scale and again as i exited dell that was very much where we were at, the front edge of that wing in terms of what does this mean and, and how can we encourage companies to get engaged. And Valuate is, you know, a very, very much smaller version of that. But it comes from that same idea that this highly disruptive technology is commercially available. What COVID has done is force everybody to get on board with it. And now it becomes a case of how do I help my organization go through the transformational pieces that are needed to get the best from this? because it's not rocket science anymore, right? And we'll talk about some of the things that, that, that I'm horizon scanning for at the moment that I think are quite exciting. Uh, and it very much ties down to that ability to access at scale technologies that were previously, you know, unavailable or too expensive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a bit of a journey there, but that's the sort of an idea of where I came from, right? That gives you a sense for who I am and, and what my background is. Yeah, and great. And then what I loved about that as well is the really clear definition of the CTO role, because it... It's, there is a bit of ambiguity at times, isn't it, about what, what is a 
typical career path and, and not there isn't one path that suits all people so so as CTO you know the understanding that there's the commercial acumen as much as the understanding of engineering and how you can marry those two is is what and I totally agree with you they're the best CTOs I've, I've ever met are the people who can genuinely do that they can translate business language or, or right. what, what I've called almost you know blunt dummy language if you like into technical specifications and the other way around being that 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 link and and that's what yeah. you have through the ball you know it's it is a it's a it's a unique and privileged position don't get me wrong you just don't walk into these mm. but you know today if i look around i see a lot of cto roles where actually software engineering is becoming you know a, a big part of what people are asking for and so an understanding of the languages that are used to develop some of the applications that, you know, that we now sort of take for granted. So there's definitely a slant that way. Yeah. Uh, and again, for, you know, for the audience watching, if you're in computing science, if you're studying programming languages, you know, these are the equivalent of where I was in the, in the late 1980s in terms of, uh, you know, a, a core skill set that you then use as the, as the sort of building blocks for what it is that you do next. But there's definitely now more of a, an angle towards the software engineering side of it. And I completely get that. I think it's actually the right direction to go in. Yeah, yeah, no, again, I, I totally agree with you. I think that the last, one of the points I've, I've also thought on that though, is sometimes there's an importance to understand that if communication and that, and that part of the, of the process isn't for you there's also other yeah. equally valuable roles out there alongside the cto being chief technical architects being being someone who just purely lives within technology is is, is as valuable for a business oh, as 100 the, the cto route. you know more so than ever and um you, so sometimes these strange roles <laughs> appear and, and you see some some quite odd job titles right but but it's kind of done as companies experiment with what's a chief digital officer? So what does that role represent? If I'm a chief information officer, that's quite well defined. A chief security officer, that's quite well defined. And you tend to have come from certain backgrounds to be able to sort of get into those, into those sort of roles, right? But you know, you, you're, you're absolutely right in terms of uh, there will be roles around the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And they themselves right now we are beginning to understand the discipline, but we've not done it at scale. And I'm going to keep coming back to that because these, these disruptive technologies are just that, but they're not done at scale yet. So there will be future roles, I think, where an understanding where you've got a background in these technologies could be at robotics, augmented virtual reality. You know, these are sort of subsets of some very interesting work that's going on right now. It's early days, but as they mature as technologies and as they become more mainstream in terms of enterprise and commercial use, then your skill sets in those areas will elevate you to a C something position. Yeah. You might not call it a CTO, right? But it'll, it'll have that as, its sort of, that, that as its sort of background. So these specialisms and your desire to be involved in them, one, they're interesting, right? And two, I think they lead to some potentially very interesting future career paths. Yeah. Yeah, again, I just couldn't agree with you more. So that, that really nicely leads on, because as you mentioned, um, you know, thoughts of emerging technologies. And as you said, there's may, maybe not at scale yet, but there is a lot yeah. entering the market at the moment. So, so what excites you when you're looking at the future landscape? So, so just a bit, of a bit of a backdrop, right? This industry has a history of going through waves of innovation, right? And 2007, the launch of the iPhone unleashed a wave of innovation, right? So that peak it went into a bit of a trough and it's now starting to build up again. And it's being built up again on the strength of technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, they themselves are sciences because you are tying, you know, maths graduates and you're tying sort of people who have a very good understanding of algorithmic behavior. You know, this is some of the bedrock for those sort of technologies, right? If you look at augmented and virtual reality, I think that's a little bit further down the track in terms of, in terms of its commerciality. But again, what's going on there in terms of the ability to blend the digital and the physical and to use the digital world as a representation of the physical world and then to take inputs from the physical world and then mirror those in the digital world. Again, I think there's some very interesting stuff that's, that's going on in those spaces. What's interesting with all of those technologies is that they are commercial. So they're at a price point and a market point that means that companies are interested in them. They are not science projects. 
right? Biotech, the embedding of chips in humans, the stuff that that might lead to, that's further down the curve in terms of, you know, one, one's people's appetite to consume it, and two, where it is in terms of the breakthrough nature of what it's doing. I think quantum is very interesting for those of you out there who are sort of looking at the quantum computing field. Again, super early days because the science and the technology involved in this is, is still a science project. But you can sort of start to see the movement and the, and the morphing of that as it, as, it moves up the, as it moves up the scale. So for those of you who are studying subjects today, right now the hot topics are artificial intelligence, machine and deep learning. Uh, and I think their applications I think the problem at the minute is it, it, I view life in pendulum swings. So the pendulum is swinging out to the right. We can do this everywhere and for everything. Mm. I'm not entirely sure that's true. The pendulum will swing, will swing back. If you think about what an autonomous vehicle is, it requires a set of technology that basically allows the vehicle to sense its own position in three dimensions, sense what's going on around it and then provide a human interface that allows you to, you know, essentially take your hand off the wheel and, and allow the vehicle to, to, to do its own thing. Well, a fleet of three or four of those navigating essentially cities in the US that don't have roundabouts is one thing. Doing that with 100,000 cars across a city that was built in the 17th century, I, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're a way off that yet. But yeah. if you are into those technologies, it's artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning that are driving those advances. So what's exciting is the, commercial, the commerciality of them, the fact that they are readily available, the fact that industry, train, industry changing companies like Tesla are using them to drive to the forefront of what will be next, but it's still early enough that if you get in now, there is still enough opportunity because the definition is sometimes a little bit loose. And because yeah. we're trying to embed it everywhere, you know, the, as I said, I think the pendulum will swing back and, and you'll, there'll be some industries that adopt this technology absolutely readily uh, and will use it and they will use it more quickly than perhaps other industries, which are, which are maybe a little bit lagging. So, it's a bit of a buzzword uh, and you know, I've come out of IT and, 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 and we throw these terms around a lot. But if you're a graduate and you're looking at these technologies right now, companies are seeing that as a white hot talent because yeah. they're trying to understand it themselves. They're trying to bring the discipline in and they're trying to see how they can use these technologies, particularly those three artificial intelligent machine and deep learning to drive a different outcome for them. And if you look further down the track, I said augmented and virtual reality, I think that's going to be absolutely fascinating. The quantum stuff and the biotech stuff, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert in those fields, but you can see a trend. Yeah. As these things become commercially available because the cost of computing continues to fall and the cost of storage continues to fall, these technologies become more accessible. When they become more accessible, you, you go out of the homebrew computer club thing, and you move into the mainstream. And when they get to the mainstream, if you've been studying them, you know, you are a very employable individual because mm -hmm. as I said, right now, those technologies are white hot and organizations are trying to figure out what to do with them. And, um, you know, those to me would be areas of, of, of interest. And I think they are personally interesting because you can wear them, right? You can see them driving on the road in the future. So they are very relatable, but they're also something that you can get involved in. And it's still early enough. I think that's the beauty of this. Yeah. It's still early enough to make it super interesting. And, and again, that, that last point, I think, is, is, is one of the most exciting parts. It is early enough that the, 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 the evolution has, has only really just begun, although AI and, and machine learning and, and deep learning have been around theoretically, as Since you mentioned. The 50s. Yeah. Since the 1950s. Yeah, gosh, yeah, that long then you see. So it's, yeah, as, as a theory or academia, it's been around for Correct. a long time. But it's you're right; it's the turning point is when you can commercialize it, and and then companies will invest more into it, and that's where the future is is part of the strategy, I guess. Yeah, I think sometimes you know there, there are companies out there, and, and uh, again, within within our world, it's a bit of a cliche. But you know what Elon Musk or Tesla is doing is he's challenging the established powertrain in a vehicle. Model 3 looks like a car. It's the powertrain that's different. And the technology that's packed into it very, very clearly shows what can happen in the future. But you know, you've got to get it talking to traffic lights. You've got to get it talking to wrist devices because you can't let those vehicles loose in a city on their own because yeah. they because it's it's just not integrated enough, right? 
And the other interesting thing to look for, and, and sometimes, you know, you'll see this in people, you know, Elon Musk never worked for NASA, but he's done SpaceX. He never worked for Ford or General Motors, but he's done Tesla. So they're really big disruptors are sometimes from outside of, in fact, very often come from outside of the industries that they are disrupting. And the reason they are so powerful is because they look at the thing that is the incumbent and they look at it through a completely different set of eyes. How do I reimagine the powertrain in a car? I, that's, you know, that was the starting point. And then what do you build around that? And then the second piece, and again, a bit of a cliche, but what Steve Jobs did was maniacally focus on the user experience. Because if you can make it simple and a little bit fun, then you get mass adoption, yeah. right? So that clarity of thought, and again, you know, Steve was a computer guy, but he, he, he entered the phone industry and changed it forever because many of the people watching this won't know life before an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. But trust me, it existed and it wasn't pretty, <laughs> right? So these disruptors often come from outside of the industries that they're disrupting. And, yeah. you know... Um, I think there are some great real world examples right now. You know, you, you, it, we're living it. It's the beauty of this is we're living through this age and you can look at these people and say, okay, what right do they have to disrupt this? They don't have any right, but they have a very good idea yeah. and they have will and the sheer force of will to get people to follow them and believe them and actually make this thing a reality. So, you know, a little bit off topic there maybe, but, but an interesting observation for me. And I, I couldn't agree again. You know, th this is a really insightful conversation because there's such clear viewpoints. And again, that, that the people coming from out of industry into industry, the disruption and being able to look at things where, where when you live something day to day, I always talk about it being above or below the parapet. And if you're doing yes. the same job, you're below the parapet the entire time, just focusing on the challenge or the problem. If you're going to look above the parapet and the bigger problem to solve that normally right. creates a much, much more interesting and successful project. So, so yeah, well, that's, and, you know, that, that leads really nicely, I guess, into the last question then, which is your, your career advice, you know, your, your thoughts to the guys and girls who are listening. There's one or two words of wisdom you could give them when they're about to enter the job market. What would it be? So a bit of a cliche again, but the best companies want to hire the best people. So be the best. You know, you are in an academic institution where you have access to a fantastic set of resources and people, and you have the freedom of thinking that you might never get again in your life to go and experiment with ideas and concepts, which, uh, you know, your academic establishment will actually be encouraged you to do, right? Be the best you can be at that. Because as you come out and as you look into the job market, you know, and 2020 is skewed, there's no two ways about it, but people still want to hire the best talent. And the best talent is those who have a passion and an interest in their topic, who can talk authoritatively about it, who have a clear sense of their own place in it, and maybe a vision for where they think they can take it, right? You know, there's, nobody ever has been accused of dreaming too big. So in that regard, you know, as you, as you, as you come out of this educational period that you're in, be the best that you can be because the best companies want to hire the best talent. And if you have enough conviction that your idea is worthy of something that will start upon its own, Charlie, I don't know about you, but for me, actually there's never a bad time to start up. You know, if you've got a good idea and you can get people and money and capital behind it, regardless of where we are in this, this year, I don't think there's ever a bad time to start up. And don't be afraid of starting up, right? Because it can be a fantastic journey. You'll, <laughs> you'll never work so hard in your life, but the reward at the end of it can, can be quite incredible. So, you know, be the best that you can be and don't be afraid to start up if you think that that's something that you, that you actively want to do. Yeah. Nigel, what, what great advice. And, and again, you're, you know, the, the bit about not being afraid, fearlessness is, is where, you know, and, and again, the listeners, where you're starting the careers, these are the best times to do it, isn't it? You know, it's, it's a time when, you know, you should be thinking about pushing yourself and, and what else you can do. And, and there is no limit to boundaries if you've got the right support framework around you as well, I guess, which is the other 100%. 100%. You know, the, I, I, I think the, the startup dream is one of, well, I'll just work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and, you know, it'll all happen. You, I, I promise you this, you'll never work so hard in your life. Um, but the rewards personally, the rewards professionally, 
your ability to make an impact. I mean, you know, uh, this is not related to us, but I've often asked this question. We have a climate crisis going on, but it took a 16 year old Swedish girl to really light the fire under it, no pun intended. Yeah. What did she have? What was it that Greta Thunberg has that nobody else had that was able to get a movement or, you know, the theory that this thing becomes a movement and once it becomes a movement, it becomes unstoppable. And you might be involved right now in researching something which is a thing that becomes a movement. And when it becomes a movement, well, you know, as I said, I've often asked that question and I don't know the answer by the way. Yeah. But there was something that that young lady had that sparked a global revolution around what we're trying to do. And I think when you think about that and you think about the possibilities when you put her in the frame, well, you know, the sky is literally the limit. And if you're Elon Musk, it's not even the limit. So, you know, there are, there are, uh, there are people who naturally have this, uh, you know them, you'll gravitate towards them. If they have the ability to, to move the needle in a way that others don't hang around them, yeah. I'd be a part of that journey because it can be quite incredible. Yeah. Yeah, Nigel, thank you. Thank you so much. That's been a really, really interesting overview and some really insightful thoughts there. So, yeah, thank you. And to everyone listening, that's a, another Future Take podcast series. Um, it's going to be posted on our YouTube channel, Spotify, and the career pages for the partner universities, which I'm happy to say are growing by the day. So, I think we now have 12 partner universities where these podcasts are hopefully of value and, and giving you all some insight into real life experiences and thoughts. So one more time, thank you, Nigel. Charlie, it was an absolute pleasure. Really great talking to you. Uh, I, you know, I trust this finds a suitable audience and you know, I know you and I are more than willing to engage in sort of future conversations with, with folks that want to talk to us. So you know, the, these doors are open, but thank you. And again, thank you, Charlie, for the opportunity. Fantastic. Okay, everybody, until next time, that's another episode.